All right, let's get going. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Great turnout. Um, so I'm up here with uh, Jin Tan and Wojciech Turek from uh, Cambridge and Monash. Uh, we're going to talk about how we've approached Lustre integration for our OpenStack HPC uh, environments. Uh, the way we're doing this talk is uh, Wojciech's going first. He'll talk about how things are done at Lustre and some of the benchmarks results that they've got with their setup. And then we'll go ahead and do the same for Monash. And at the end, we'll come together and talk about uh, the challenges and so on that we face doing this and take questions. Okay, cool. over you. Hello, uh, my name is Wojciech Turek. I work, uh, work at University of Cambridge. I'm team lead, uh, team lead of uh, research computing platforms. Um, so I start by telling you a little bit about what we do in Cambridge. Uh, so uh, I'm in the Research Computing Services Division, which is a part of the, uh, the main uh, University Information Services Department. And um, we have a broad remit of, to provide uh, research computing um, to, the, to the broader university, the whole university. Uh, we have uh, over 700 active users from uh, 42 university departments, and uh, uh, our systems are 80% utilized all the time. Um, so our focus is on providing cutting-edge uh, research computing facilities to our researchers and supporting them. But we also uh, do um, uh, a lot of industrial outreach. So we work with industrial partners. We work on projects with Jaguar Land Rover, uh, Rolls Royce, uh, and, and many others. Um, we also work with uh, vendors on uh, developing uh, solutions for research computing. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about our research computing infrastructures. Uh, uh, two years ago, we uh, built a new data center. Um, it was a very big project. Uh, it has four data holes, um, high availability, very high resiliency. We've got 180 cabinets in total in the, in the data center, three megawatts of power, and there is 24-7 staff. Um, and also, it's uh, very high security standards. Um, the research computing uh, part is actually taking, as you may guess, most of the data center. We're actually using 100 racks at the moment, and we keep growing. Uh, we have two megawatts of power. We're not using that much, that much, that much already, but uh, we, we quickly consume more and more power uh, as, as our uh, infrastructure grows. Um, and we're using very uh, new technology to cool the racks. We, we have some racks with 35 kilowatts, so we're using uh, uh, cool doors and ev evaporative uh, power. And we are actually managing to get very good PUE of one point one five. Um, so currently, uh, we have a number of uh, research computing platforms. Uh, uh, we've got 600 nodes, uh, compute cluster called Darwin. It was uh, installed in 2012. And at that time, it, was, it, it took a 93rd place in the top 500 list um, of the biggest supercomputers in the world. Um, we got also 128 node GPU cluster, which has 256 NVIDIA K20 GPUs. Um, we've got a total of five petabytes of storage currently, uh, as uh, pr provided as Lustre Parallel File System. And we've got 20 petabytes of uh, type cold storage. Um, we also recently uh, uh, built uh, a new uh, platform for our new project, uh, Biomedical Cloud where we have uh, 200 nodes, and this is a hybrid uh, infrastructure, which I'll be, talk I'll be talking about that a bit later. Uh, it has HPC, OpenStack, uh, data analytics elements, and, and storage. Uh, we also have a large Hadoop system with 200 nodes um, and OpenStack. Um, so we're providing. Um, research computing services to the entire university. So we have a very wide range of scientific discipline using our systems. We've got uh, astronomers. Uh, we were involved in the SKA project. You may have heard uh, uh, during the keynote from my boss talking about the uh, uh, 
Biomed Cloud, and we have, we have also departments from physics and engineering, all very large projects and uh, requiring very large amount of, of computing and power and storage. Um, so for, for most of them, we're using uh, high performance parallel file system uh, and we're using Luster. So probably not all of you know what Luster is, so I will give you a quick introduction to, to, to Luster. So Luster is a, a high performance, highly scalable parallel file system. Um, it consists of uh, storage side, uh, server side and client side. The server side is object storage servers, which then have object storage target and these, they, they store actual data. And then, we, then um, there's also a metadata element with uh, metadata targets and metadata servers. And um, the beauty of Luster is that it can be scaled up um, uh, as big as, as, as we wanted um, we, by just adding more uh, either object storage servers if we need more capacity or more metadata servers and storage if we need more metadata par, uh, performance. Um, so it can be, the, the, it, it, it presented a single namespace and, and can grow to tens of petabytes and can provide hundreds of gigabytes per second. Um, the client and, and, and the file system supports uh, multiple of network connections, so it, it works with interconnects like Omnipath, InfiniBand, uh, Rocky, or, or just standard Ethernet. So it's very, very flexible. Um, so one of the projects that we did in 2016 was building up a biomedical cloud. This was project, project done with a school of uh, medicine and school, school of biology in the University of Cambridge. And uh, the requirement was to build a, a new computational platform to, 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 to provide uh, them with a better facilities to, to analyze the data. And uh, um, we ended up building up hybrid infrastructure with HPC uh, components with uh, Hadoop uh, cluster and also OpenStack and with a range of storage backends, a large uh, three petabyte Luster file system uh, and 1.2 petabyte NAS storage and, and uh, a large type uh, backend for storing cold data. So the, 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 these uh, platforms are connected via uh, private networks to the uh, ho hospital and to departments around hospital. So. Uh, the data can, can, can move to our data center and then be processed, analyzed, and used by the, by the researchers. Uh, one of the first projects uh, that we implemented in now beta testing was a project for, uh, with Walson Brain Imaging Center. Um, so they, they were placing the they, um, brain imaging facility, they were installing new scanners and, and also replacing the uh, compute facility. So uh, we worked with them and agreed that uh, we will, uh, because of the requirements on isolation and security, we build up this, this new uh, computational infrastructure inside OpenStack. So uh, we designed uh, uh, the, the, the platform, essentially um, it, it is a cluster uh, with compute nodes, login nodes, scheduler, and uh, different types of storage. Um, on, on your uh, uh, left, you can see the green boxes. This is actually uh, external storage, uh, which is not, uh, which is, which is uh, Luster and Tape and NAS storage that we then enable inside our OpenStack tenant. Um, so we use for that, we use provider networks. Um, um, and we, we access the, we, we create VLANs within OpenStack and on the physical network uh, to provide access inside, inside the tenant. Um, and we are managing that tenant, so we are the system administrators of that tenant. It's all uh, deployed with Ansible playbooks, so it's fully automated and, and can be rebuilt and recreated as, uh, and changed as, as, as we need to. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our OpenStack. So um, our OpenStack uh, infrastructure consists of three zones. Uh, we've got uh, 50 gigabit ethernet, which we use for uh, uh, Cinder storage, access uh, for SRIOV instances, for uh, fast network and, and uh, RDMA uh, accelerated instances, and also used for VXLAN for tenants network. Um, we also have 10 gigabit network uh, on, each on each hypervisor to, uh, for uh, 
using it with provider and external networks. Um, so our last file systems will be accessed via the 10 gig uh, network. And we also have one gigabit network for management and provisioning. Um, so we use VLANs for SRE of V uh, networks and for provider networks. But inside tenants, uh, we, we use VXLANs to separate the networks. Um, so we use uh, Mellanox switches. They um, are the, uh, the latest range called Spectrum. They, uh, so we've got 100 gigabit switches, which then split, we split those ports into 250 gigabit uh, ports. And we've got also Spectrum switches, which provide uh, 10 gigabit ports. Um, so uh, this is a specification of our OpenStack nodes. We've got three controller nodes and uh, 80 compute nodes and, and uh, three different type of networks. Uh, uh, we've got a small Ceph pool um, for uh, Cinder backend also and for Glance. And then we have a large uh, Cinder pool, which is uh, uh, actually two large uh, Cinder pools using uh, uh, Nexenta store. And uh, we use uh, Red Hat OSP8, um, which is essentially a Liberty. Um, our last uh, infrastructure is, um, so, it's, 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 so we have multiple file systems. Uh, in, in, in this slide, I only describe uh, our la uh, latest uh, file system that we use for the bio cloud. Um, and th this consists of, it's essentially, uh, as you can see, it fits into one rack. On the top of that rack, we've got metadata servers with metadata storage, and, and, and the rest of the rack is filled with object storage servers and object, object uh, storage. Uh, the entire rack provides two petabytes of usable capacity after, after raiding it. Um, and we've got two metadata servers and six uh, object storage servers, and they ex uh, we expect to achieve 600 gigabytes a second on the 10 gig network and 20 gigabytes a second on the InfiniBand network on the bare metal clusters. Um, so we use uh, Intel Enterprise Edition Luster for, uh, on, on our uh, production file systems. Um, uh, the, the, the current version uh, uh, is in, uh, IEL 301. Um, and we also use Red Hat 7.2 as operation system. So we've done uh, some benchmarks by using um, virtual instances on, on our BioCloud OpenStack uh, platform. We, uh, uh, the luster is connected via provider networks. We created 12 instances uh, with uh, small flavor. Uh, this flavor is using pinning, uh, CPU pinning. Um, um, we, first test we do, we've done with uh, small instances, co uh, four cores, uh, two gigabytes of RAM. And we've noticed that the, uh, the write performance was very, very slow. Uh, that's the blue line. Um, uh, and read was actually pretty good. Um, so we increased the size of instances to eight cores, and, and the write improved a little bit uh, for small uh, thread counts. But again, uh, if we increased the number of threads, it actually um, went uh, down. Um, and, 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 it, and we didn't continue to increase this because it was already pretty bad. So we decided that we increase the instances to a, a bigger flavor, and we created 12 instances uh, using 12 cores and 16 gigabytes of RAM. And, um, and the behavior changed dramatically. Uh, suddenly, we're actually getting full 6 gigabytes a second on read and write. And it's very consistent. Uh, by, uh, we, 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 we run a test with 144. Uh, processes. So we use IOR benchmark. Uh, IO, IOR benchmark is uh, a very popular HPC benchmark, which uses MPI to synchronize the, the, the threads on the, on the, on the compute nodes. Um, and, uh, and, and as you can see, we actually achieved very good performance uh, on the large instances. Um, we also run some metadata tests. So uh, this test is, is uh, in, in, in every run, it, it creates um, one million files. And you can see that for very small, uh, so uh, if we use just single um, 
instance, it, 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 the, the metadata uh, operations, are, the, the numbers are not great, but as we increase the number of, of instances and processes per instance, then the, uh, the file creation file uh, uh, start and file removal uh, increases. Um, so it's scaling very nicely. Um, so this is all from me, for, uh, and I would like to thank you, my colleagues from my team, uh, Paul Brown and Matt Russell Barnett, because they did most of the heavy lifting, getting the numbers done. So thank you very much. And Last one. Do you want uh, your letter? Okay. Uh, all right, well, you already know who we are. Okay, so um, here's what I'm talking about. A uh, quick overview of Monash, uh, particularly some of our um, imaging facilities in, at the Clayton campus. Um, the 21st century microscope uh, abstraction that we use as our sort of our um, catch cry at the moment, and uh, our research cloud, and particularly also the Nectar Research Cloud Federation in Australia, uh, which we're a member of, and then on to Massive, which is a particular HPC facility that we run, and M3, which is the latest resource, part of uh, the latest cluster in the Massive project. Uh, okay, so Monash, quickly, um, Probably, you know, people in Europe and the US may or may not have heard of us. Um, we're in the top 0.5% of universities worldwide, very research intensive university. Uh, we also, I think in Australia, we're actually the largest university by the number of students. Um, six campuses also around the world. Uh, so Clayton Campus, which is where we work, uh, is a, uh, a globally unique hub for uh, particularly medical imaging. Uh, we have a lot of interesting uh, microscopes here. I'll talk a bit about the, a bit more about the, a couple of those in particular later on, um, particularly the cryo electron microscope and lattice light sheet. Uh, the, so microscopes these days though are not just the facilities that we have actually dealing with light and so on. There's a full integrated stack where HPC particularly is a big part of that and that's where you see Massive in the picture there. Uh, and also Rackmon, which is our research cloud as well. Um, come along. So Rackmon is a node of the Nectar Research Cloud in Australia. We have um, a whole bunch of regular um, commodity infrastructure as a service compute and big pile of Ceph storage. We also have a bunch of specialist capabilities, um, SSD, high memory, GPUs, that sort of stuff. The Nectar project um, is worth mentioning here because we've been running this now for quite a while. So Nectar uh, sort of went live in January of 2012. The first release of OpenStack that we installed at Monash was Diablo for a test cluster and then I think we went live on Essex. Um, we now have eight different nodes around Australia with 10, 10 data centers and over 40,000 cores available to, for public researchers to use. Um, that's sort of the public part of the research cloud. We also leverage the Nectar Research Cloud model to build our own resources, particular, particularly for Monash or other projects. So for example, M3, which I'll talk about as we go on, is one of those. Um, we use Nova cells. So we have, at Monash, we have three cells. Two of those are public cells. One of those is uh, Purpose for our purpose built for our HPC, um, and there's also the rest of the nodes around the country. You can see those on the map there. Uh, and underpinning all of that, we have um, our NREN RNET uh, connects us all up nicely as well. So we can have um, we also run like a globally distributed 
uh, Swift cr cluster across those sites, which provides all the image storage and so on for the cloud. I didn't even realize we had transitions on these slides, okay. Um, all right, so the Massive project, Massive is a, is a special HPC facility um, for characterization, uh, specializing in imaging and visualization. So there's a few vital statistics up there about what Massive is. One of the uh, defining features, I guess, of the Massive project is that it supports a large cohort of users who are new to HPC. Um, so people you know, who have never touched a batch system. Um, and so there's, there's a few key projects that uh, Massive runs and develops to help those users and bring them into HPC and support their applications. Um, the, other, the other defining feature of Massive is that it has a very strong instrument integration um, agenda. And so you sort of you can see that depicted here. We have um, a number of instrument facilities which run special data capture software, which will help stage data into the HPC file system for the image processing and so on that needs to occur to support those facilities and also then subsequently manage the data, that the raw data that's come from the instrument and the resulting processing, help the researchers share it, that sort of thing. Um, and provide it into desktop environments that they can further analyze it in. Uh, this, is, this is just a quick example of uh, one of those examples, which is for the, um, the imaging beam line at the Australian Synchrotron, which happens to be just across the road from us and is one of the, one of the instruments on that slide earlier. Um, I'm not gonna go deep into the details here, it's just illustrative. So the other, so one of the things I mentioned before was um, the number of users that are new to HPC. So scientific desktops play a big part in the way we help cater to those users. Um, and when Jin talks later, she's got just at the end of her, uh, her results, she's got a little demo of the software that, that the Massive Project develops for that, um, because we've seen a bit of interest in that before as well. Um, I'll make a note here too, so fast file system access is quite important for these applications, of course, and many of them are not tailored to parallel I.O. necessarily, so individual client performance is important for these applications um, because they don't necessarily know how to do MPIO or uh, necessarily even multi-threaded. Damn you, Wojtek. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> um, okay, so the Massive Project started off with two HPC clusters, uh, M1 at the Australian Synchrotron and M2 at Monash University. Um, at the time, they're sort of getting probably a bit long in the tooth now, but still very useful resources. At the time, they were quite new and pioneering and bringing in a lot of GPU compute. Um, which, given the amount of image processing and so on that goes on on Massive, uh, is understandable. Um, and we've, we've continued that with M3 as well. So M3 was announced earlier this year. Uh, project's funded by Monash University. Um, it's specializing in next, genera next generation data science. It, we've got 1,700 Haswell cores, a whole bunch of K80s, uh, a few smaller GPUs to support lower end visualization workloads, and about 1.2 petabytes of luster, um, all the details there. We also have a whole bunch of um, the pre-release Mellanox Spectrum gear. Um, and there we go. Um, one of the key instruments that, that the M3 was built to support is the Titan Krios. It's a cryo-electron microscope, which was recently, um, we recently had a new center built for that out at Clayton. This thing can produce terabytes of data per day, 
um, and is used for, where are we? Um, it can image down to cellular um, and subatomic level by freezing the specimen, essentially. Um, we also have another interesting facility that's just, just coming online at Clayton, which has a lattice light sheet microscope, which is used for live image sampling, um, which is going to start using M3 as well. So as I mentioned before, file system performance was, is, a, is a priority for M3. Um, the M1 and M2 resources are standard, typical bare metal HPC facilities, but with M3, um, we decided to leverage the research cloud. We'd already done this with Monash's own local campus internal HPC facility, Monarch. Um, and so with M3, we've, con we've continued that. Um, the interesting thing about this is like actually Wojtek uh, mentioned in his slides before, this allows the HPC, cl uh, HPC cluster to be built as a virtual cluster and start using those cloudy techniques for deployment. Uh, M3 is also deployed with Ansible as well. Um, and it also allows us then to take the same physical cluster and repurpose small parts of it for particular users as required. So for example, bioinformatics and so on, um, you know, they like to have Ubuntu, whereas we normally use CentOS, that sort of thing. Um, the other interesting thing about M3 that's a bit different from a regular HPC facility is that the, the network is all Ethernet, um, although it's high bandwidth Ethernet. And we have sized, we've got a fairly high over subscription ratio in our, in our leaf spine topology, which has been sized basically just for the file system bandwidth. Uh, we're not expecting and not planning to run any cross top of rack switch MPI jobs, because um, we can manage to fit uh, about a thousand cores within a rack, so that's enough. Okay, so virtualized HPC. Um, this is something uh, I talked about a bit in the, some science working group, uh, scientific working group meetings recently, so I thought I'd put a couple of graphs up here quickly just to, to show the sort of numbers that we get once we apply a little bit of tuning. Um, it's been discussed for a long time in the literature, but it's interesting that there's not a lot of production adoption yet. Um, there's, you know, the NFV folks are very active uh, at the moment in OpenStack land, and they have very similar requirements, I think, to HPC users. Um, so the main thing is we, we just don't want to end up with a, uh, a uniform memory access layout like we have in that little diagram there, uh, where the guest virtual machines can't see the topology of memory or CPU on the host. Um, and fortunately now, OpenStack makes it pretty easy to do all of this. So um, we use, for example, just image properties to select the, the Newman topology and pinning and so on that we want. Um, and that gets passed through down to, the, uh, to Nova on the host to appropriately set up libvirt to pin. Um, and there's, of course, a few other features to, to disable on the host as well. You probably don't want to be over committing memory and that sort of thing. So uh, I've got a couple of graphs here. These will run just on a single host. Uh, it's a two socket box, uh, Haswell 2680, um, 256 gig of RAM. It's got K80s in it, Malinox, all that stuff. We ran both high performance Linpack, which is uh, MPI based and Intel optimized Linpack, which is using their MKL libraries. Uh, and that's just an SMP benchmark. We, our host environment here is using trusty because we're running OpenStack Liberty components, but we use a Xenial kernel and grab QMU from the Mataka Cloud Archive. Uh, the reason we've gone for that version of QMU is actually to do with PCI pass-through um, because there were some issues with uh, using K80s with anything lower than 2.3. Uh, we have kernel same page merging disabled and transparent huge pages disabled here. And the guest 
is a CentOS 7 guest, 310 kernel. It's one of our large GPU computing flavors, so it takes up the whole host. Whereas if we were, say, if we had the host using uh, set up for interactive desktops, then it might have four virtual machines on it. So this is what we see with uh, high performance Limpack. Um, so you've got the yellow or orange line is the naive configuration of the guest, which is where the guest is 24 sockets of one core each, one thread, no pinning, uh, and one big 240 gig single NUMA cell. Um, the blue um, is the optimized version where the CPU topology and the NUMA topology has been enabled in the guest and though the, uh, the guest physical, uh, sorry, the physical cores have been pinned, uh, the virtual cores have been pinned to the physical cores and the memory as well. So you can see that's the average there is um, about 98.5% um, performance across the different Linpack problem sizes. The other couple of lines there are, the green line particularly is um, one instance where we pinned in reverse. So we've got the compute, compute cores pinned to the opposite NUMA node. So that green line illustrates the impact of NUMA locality basically for you. That's the, um, that's the unoptimized version. <laughs> the, um, the red line is, is just demonstrates a, an interesting um, issue that we bumped into where, which we still haven't really gotten to the bottom of, but we've found a workaround for, where um, inside the guest, the hardware locality library that's part of OpenMPI, when you just pin based on the normal Haswell core layout and say, uh, you know, it's in alternating, alternating cores per socket, so you've got one, three, five, seven on socket zero and two, four, and et cetera on socket one. Um, it thinks it's got overlapping CPU sets and so errors out and looks like it can't, then can't decide to pin itself properly. Um, fortunately, if you just give the guest uh, sequential core numbering and pin, pin to the physical socket in the same way, then you get the nice blue line. Um, though that trend continues for Intel MK, uh, the Intel SMP Limpack. So blue bars are the bare metal, and that's, all in, that's in gigaflops. Um, and you can see that the optimized guest is, is coming up to basically the bare metal performance there too. Uh, and I should mention, um, the, these are all average numbers of a large number of runs. The standard deviation here is very, is very low, uh, except at the small end of problem sizes where in the virtualized setup, it takes the first couple of runs, and the, the, you know, they takes their sub-second runs for these problem sizes are slower than the bare metal. The bare metal sort of jumps up to that performance straight away. Um, okay, so now for high-performance file system integration, the way we've approached this is um, we've done it. We've kind of done it um, a couple of different ways, and for M3. We've chosen just the direct SROV path. Um, the M3 nodes can have, they've got a number of different provider networks available to them. They've got an internal management network. Uh, they've got a public, public network. They can attach ports for any of those things, of course. But all the flavors also just have um, an SROV VF assigned to them as well. So the, and the hypervisor is pre-configured with virtual functions attached to the data VLAN. Um, this is okay at the moment because we just have a, essentially a single tenant on these machines. Um, but going forward, we actually plan to use the, the Malinox um, ML2 driver so that we can have that orchestrated properly. Um, but this, this, the plumbing here is essentially the same. 
So we have this data VLAN, which is RDMA capable, so the network's been set up to be able to run rocky traffic. And the luster here is bare metal luster. It's the Intel Enterprise luster, like Cambridge are running. And um, that's configured to use the luster network O2IB driver. Uh, and so given the audience, I figured somebody would eventually ask why not CFFS, so I thought I'd throw this in. Um, well, for one thing, CFFS actually wasn't even announced production ready um, when, when we started planning this project. Um, and just that pace of development is perhaps one of, those, one of the reasons why we chose Lustre here. Uh, also, as I've mentioned a couple of times, file system performance is very important for these applications. And at the moment, we're un uncertain, not confident about whether Ceph's right performance will be able to match Lustre, given you've got the overhead of replication on the network. Um, that's something that we're interested in, certainly interested in playing around with, though. Uh, and of course, support. OK, so that's me done. So Jin's going to come up now and uh, show you some of the, the benchmark numbers that we've got up on our setup. No, uh, yeah, okay. Hi guys, um, I'm Jin. I'm here to talk about Lhasa as a high performance file systems. Um, it's great that I don't have a lot of marketing slides, um, so I'll just jump straight into the technical details. So um, M3 Lhasa hardware. Uh, we got two um, MDSs and two um, MDTs, as Wachet mentions before. We need um, the MDS, MDT, o, o, OSS, OST to run the LASA fast system. In this case, uh, in M3, we are using the Intel manager for LASA to manage the fast system. Um, we, and and we, we got a total of 1.1 petabytes of um, fast system, usable fast system for dedicated to the M3 HPC users. So this is the actual M3 LASA layout. So you can see that uh, we have the management network uh, as well as the data network. So the LASA clients will talk to the OSS as well as the MDSs uh, that directly on the Milano Spectrum uh, network. Uh, and the management network is used to um, manage the servers. As, as you can see as well, the OSSs are cost pair uh, so that we can, it allows the failover for the uh, OSTs. So uh, one thing I like about Lhasa is Lhasa supports various types of network. Um, the one that I'm familiar with, for example, IB, GIG-E, IP, Rocky, and some of those that I never came across. Uh, LNet is a set of protocols and API to support the high performance, high availability, as well as recovery of the file system. So as a sysadmin, you can use LNet self-test. It's actually a, a tool to measure the performance across the host networking. And as the users, you can actually Stripe your files, or to, to decide how you want to split your files across the OSTs. LT, uh, so in this case, the LNet configurations. So how, how did we actually set up the um, Lhasa file systems on, the, uh, on M3? So basically, you just have to install the OFX uh, on both servers and clients. So, and next thing, you need to make sure that uh, you have the UDEF rule set up. Uh, you want to make sure that the interface name, the MTUs, any DNS, DHCP, IP address, as you want, is consistent across all the instances. And I would suggest that you set it up uh, as an Ansible role for Lustre in this case. 
And next thing, you need to make sure you have the module file set up so that the NIC address is actually using the O2IP, O2IB driver because uh, for both server and the client, you picked up the TCP instead because we are using the Rocky network. Um, next thing, you want to consider writing a systemd script as well for mounting and unmounting luster on the client as well as uh, putting the NHC um, script to check the file system and network availability for the slum, for the scheduler. So I did uh, the two tests as well. Um, I wouldn't say it's a benchmark. I would probably say more like a performance test uh, in my uh, scenario because the system that, uh, while I was doing all the tests, uh, the system is actually quite busy. So um, I use MD test and IOR as well. Um, as what I mentioned before, MD test uses um, MPI to create states and remove the files. In this case, we are using open MPI that come with the, uh, we, we compile the open MPI with the Mananox MXN, which is the accelerator that come with the OFAC installations. So it measures the performance in ops per second. And the next one is just the command that I use to perform the test. And in this case, I only perform the test on fast only. So this is a, the graph, uh, a very simple one, showing the file creations, file read, and file removal operations between the bare metal and uh, virtual machine. Uh, as you can see, the results are quite promising which is especially uh, the VM is actually not optimized, which is we didn't actually apply any new topology in this case. Uh, the test is running on across uh, two nodes. So IOR uh, is something that I like to use because it's really easy to set up and it, you can define uh, how do you want to run it as well to uh, accommodate your small, medium, large file size as well as uh, the throughputs. So the good thing about IOR is uh, you can use the MPI to sync the tasks and define how many processes and how many tasks you want to do. In this case, uh, it's rather a small file size because in our environment, we don't have a lot of big size, uh, large file size. Um, so in this case, it's 12 gigs uh, using the 24 cores. Yep, uh, this is not what I expected when I uh, finished running <laughs> the test. Uh, for some reason, the blue line, which is the virtual machine, actually performed well better than the bare metal. <laughs> so yay, so we're quite happy, but I have no idea what it ha why it happens. Uh, one thing that um, I want to point out is the, the file system was really busy. Uh, it's fully reserved when I was doing the test, as well as I'm not running the test on the same machine that run the instances. Uh, but the reason I put in the graph uh, is to show you that uh, the more MPI tasks that you throw in, more thread, and it actually increases the performance of writing to the file system. In this case, we actually get about close to six gigabyte per second for 24 tasks. Okay, so um, Blair mentions about um, visualization is very important um, in Massive. And in, uh, in Monash, we have an in-house development, which is called a software that uh, is called Strudel. It's named after the dessert, but it's not. <laughs> uh, it's a remote visualization tools. Uh, you can go to the link if you have an account, just go to desktop.massive.org.au. Uh, it's a cross platform application as well, so you can run it on um, Mac, Windows, or Linux machine. The backend technology is just a simple SSH tunnel that launching a turbo VNC sections. Sorry that it's not a live one because I don't trust the network here, uh, so I have to throw in a video on how, we, how a user can go in and 
request a desktop session. So you log in as the user, and then it will, this is a federated uh, identity in Australia that we're using. And you can select uh, which um, desktop session that you want to run on, on which cluster. Um, you can accept the default configurations, or you can change how many processes, memories that you want to use for your desktop sessions. And this would, uh, this would actually, this actually integrate with the Slurm uh, job scheduler. So it allows, um, it depends how, how much resources you are allowed in your projects. And you just have to click a show desktop. What happened? No, I think your, your de laptop died. Oh, seriously? Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I've, I've still got caps lock. It's good. It's good. <laughs> uh, all right. All right. Even the plan B doesn't work. <laughs> no. Oh. oh, no. <laughs> I can use my laptop. Yeah, we're going to. We, we need your last slide anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, if you go, if you, it's power. If you want to ask a question, can you come over to the mic, please, so we can recall it? Okay. <laughs> uh, during you set up your laptop, I'd uh, yep. like to ask a question about the. Um, do you have data to support that your conclusion that uh, last year is better than CFFS? Or is it just a, you know, assumption? Or, no? Uh, well, no, no, I didn't say last year is better than CFFS. Oh, um, but I said that that's what we chose for M3 uh, because of the reasons that I listed there. So the, the primary issue was, for one thing, CFFS wasn't production ready at the time that we actually purchased this system. Um, but also one thing that we're unsure of and that we would like to do some testing of, because we're also a big Ceph user, um, is of performance for, for example, for single client write performance, um, whether or not that can, with Ceph's architecture, actually ever be as good as a system like Lustre or not because you have to, for, 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 every, for every chunk of data that you write to Ceph, you have to write that n times for the replication and then you incur latency every time. Okay, so I'll just fast forward to the end. Come on. Okay, and then you get a, <coughs> a desktop sessions and uh, a list of the applications that your project is allowed to use, and all the modules will be loaded um, when you launch the applications. So this is really helpful when a researcher comes in and says, I want to just see the image and analyze it on the desktop. Um, and it's very easy for people that doesn't have a lot of experience with um, changing the job scripts as well. Okay, so lastly, um, nothing is perfect. Okay, there's a lot of challenges, trade off problems that we have. Uh, for security reasons, um, with Lassa, we only want to deploy on the managed trusted tenants. Um, and we find it that the performance is, uh, is really poor for the small flavors. Um, and for multi tenancy, we will still need to be. Uh, upgrade the Lhasa <laughs> because uh, it's only available in version 2.9 and it's actually fairly new as well and uh, which will support the uh, subdirectory mounts, uh, client nodes authentication by the Kerberos. Getting the network 
working is not easy. Black can jump in. <laughs> uh, it requires a, a lot of uh, combinations of NIC firmware, switch firmware, and OFAC. Well, we both, both, both Monash and Cambridge for these for these systems that we've talked about were early adopters of of Spectrum, um, and there was at least one instance where there was um, switch firmware updates that that weren't compatible with NIC firmware. So. Um, suddenly host ports stop working until the firmware is upgraded and that sort of thing. Um, we've also found, because we're using SROV, um, that some, in some cases, firmware updates on the NIC will remove the SROV port. And if you, um, if you have, you know, you want to do a host upgrade, but keep the guests on that host alive and bring them back up afterwards. You know, you say you want to take a host down for half an hour to do an upgrade. Um, if you still have Nova Compute running when you do that and the SROV port disappears, then Nova will delete it from the database and then the host will come back with and, and have its port disappeared on it. Um, so that's a bit of a gotcha. Um, and, oh, and this last point is, is one of Wojcik's um, a challenge that they've been working on at the moment too, with uh, VXLAN performance not being not being quite what's advertised. Yes, so we're supposed to be having offloading on the on the NICs, and um, we're still working on getting the performance that we're supposed to be getting with that offloading. Um, yes, and then I think although we your deployment was done a few months earlier than ours, I think we went through the same uh, process yep. of of pain. Uh, but I think uh, well, the level of support we received was good, and, and uh, we have a working configuration now, and, and we're working on fixing these performance issues. So I think we're on the good way. Yep. All right. So questions, please. <coughs> hey. Uh, you seem to have done a lot of uh, tuning uh, of uh, the configuration of, of Nova, the images, the instance types, and so on to to map to the the hardware, the NUMA, etc. Is it something that could be published as a reference architecture uh, on OpenStack? Yeah, definitely. Um, so Stig, who who's co-chair of the scientific working group, has been working on a bunch of. Uh, reference cases, use cases, um, over the last couple of months, one of which um, I've contributed to, and we will, it doesn't, it actually doesn't yet have all that level of detail in it, but that will be a live document, and we will continue to flesh those details out. Um, when, when that stuff's, there's also a book being put together um, for supercomputing, um, and I think when when that happens, that that will go live somewhere on OpenStack site too. So we'll hope to continue adding to and building on that. And uh, did you find anything that was missing in Nova that you would have needed? Um, no, uh, no. So we're on now that we're. What did I say? We we're running Liberty. Um, I think since Kilo. All that stuff's been there. Yep. Okay, thanks. Okay, yeah, done. Thank We're you. being told time. I think the last question. Uh, apparently, we all have to oh. go to beer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> go out of go. Um, we have a cryos that's currently in boxes waiting to be unboxed. Ah, uh, yes. Did you have to make special provision for it? Uh, well, I think. Um, what happened is it showed up and, and we were like, oh shit. <laughs> um, how do you mean special provision? I mean, yeah, it has, a, it has its own room, it needs all sorts of physical Well, power just, to, just to guarantee the throughput that it requires. Uh, okay, so I guess we kind of, I mean, we knew what the capture rates and stuff were from the, the cameras on it and, and the cameras that they're planning to get as they upgrade. Um, so the acquisition rate, though, does not necessarily correlate directly to what you need the file system to do. 
Um, we kind of, we, I think we just sort of knew we needed about a thousand cores. Mm. Um, the main thing being that we want to be able to keep the thing acquiring at a reasonable rate. I think that, I don't know how many samples they can get through in a day, but um, you know, they, I th I, they might do maybe three or four samples or something in a day. Is that sound right, Steve? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. <laughs> The other quick thing was uh, you're using SRIOV, so I assume that means you're not bothered about live migration. No. Yep. Okay. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, guys.